board. He laid out that board. He populated that board. He, you know, he debugged the heck out of that board. And, and that, that single piece that's just going to be one little picture on slide, you know, 68 or something, was, is worthy of a master's thesis in and of itself, right? So, um, and, and, there's, and it's examples like that abound throughout the talk. Like, he's going he's gonna to show you some of these funnels for an airplane, and you're just going to see these funnels appear. And, and what you don't realize is that's the first time anybody's ever calculated something that complex for a model of this complexity, right? So um, throughout this thesis, you're gonna just see just dripping with, with sort of, uh, with just amazing results um, all the way through to take the system that we were, this first idea of how having an airplane land on a first is something that really, really, really works. And we're, we're just, we're so happy to have had him in the group for so, for, for well, I didn't mean to say it for so long. <laughs> <laughs> for, some, for just a short amount of time. Uh, you know. Uh, we're so proud of, of all the work he's done, and I'm, and I'm really happy to, to watch his talk today. Great. Thanks, Russ. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you today about robust uh, post for some of our, our work in this area. Uh, so to begin, I want to have us look at a video of a bird. Uh, this is a step eagle executing uh, a perching maneuver to land on some farm. And some, there's some really interesting things going on uh, in this uh, particular maneuver that the bird is executing. So if you sort of look at some uh, stills of this video, um, what you have here is you can see the bird uh, beginning to pitch up. So it's starting to move its, its body into a very high body angle. Um, and then the authors say that, if they look at this and they say, oh, it usually comes wind in and perhaps to increase lift by creating sort of a delta uh, wind configuration. Um, and then it totally spreads out its wings. And it uses these wings sort of like a parachute to stop itself, um, using almost like an air brake to slow itself down and um, exploit what we call uh, pressure drag um, to land on this person's arm. So this is a really incredible viewer that these birds do. Um, and the thing that we would like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to take and part of the, uh, the ability of these birds and, and uh, bring this into sort of this, the domain of unmanned aerial vehicles um, and be able to capture some of these ag aggressive maneuvers that birds do um, in, in this space. And sort of even beyond that, uh, birds can execute these maneuvers in all kinds of different uh, uh, certain situations where there's wind gusts, where uh, <clears throat> there's very complicated flow over their, their wings. Um, and you can imagine that being able to do this would be very useful for a situation where you're trying to land uh, a main aerial vehicle on an aircraft carrier. Um, and in this case, maybe be able to, in, to land it in you know, only a fraction of what the length of a runway that they land now. Um, and even beyond that, there's some more applications of this technology. Um, here you have a bird sort of perching uh, on uh, a power line. Um, and there's been a lot of work um, done in uh, different uh, domains, um, and this is one domain, uh, sort of a particular project where they're trying to get a UAV that could actually trickle charge um, its batteries uh, by landing on a power line and harvesting the energy. And so we're sort of motivated by these types of power harvesting uh, applications and purchase there applications sort of bring the, uh, the ability of birds into sort of uh, unmet aerial vehicle domain. And so there's a, a real challenge to being able to do this with unmanned aero vehicles. And this is sort of what we call the, the post-stall perching problem. And so one of the major challenges with uh, uh, doing what birds do is essentially uh, if you look at a wing in steady level flight, what you'll notice is that the air around it uh, is very uh, uh, smooth and attached to the wing. Um, and this has some very nice properties. So the lift is very uh, <coughs> well predicted uh, in these cases. Uh, the models. Uh, have been well studied, um, and, and most of our aircraft try to fly in, in this regime. Um, however, as you start pitching the wing up and increasing what we call angle attack, and that is the, the angle between the direction of the airflow uh, and, the, and the pitch of the wing, what you'll see is the air begins to separate behind the wing. Uh, it begins to shed vortices behind the wing, um, and this be, uh, creates a very complicated flow scenario. Uh, which we don't know how to model well, and it also starts to uh, reduce uh, lift drastically on the wing. Uh, so you notice, like if you look at an F-18 Super Hornet coming into land in an aircraft carrier, these uh, highly advanced aircraft come in at a very conservative angle of attack, about 8.1 degrees. Whereas if you look at a cardinal landing on a branch, they're all the way up to the 90 degree body pitch, almost 180 degrees uh, angle of attack upon landing. So birds are doing something fundamentally, fundamentally uh, different than what our aircraft are doing. Um, and they're not necessarily constrained by this, this post-stall uh, problem. <clears throat> and so there's been a lot of uh, different work uh, in the aerospace and control community to sort of leverage this perching technology in micro-air vehicles. Uh, and sort of these uh, approaches have sort of taken two different sides. 
One approach is try to uh, use hardware design to enable this perch maneuver. So here's a particular example that pitches only the body of the aircraft up to create drag, but keeps the wings at a very conservative angle of attack, so uh, it's able to maintain control authority. Um, and other approaches have sort of tried to uh, use a very simple aircraft design, but focus a lot on the control design and the, um, and the complexity that lies in sort of designing controllers uh, to execute this perch maneuver. Uh, and so we're going to be building on this particular work by Corey and Kendrick and Elite, uh, which uses a very simple fixed wing glider um, and some complicated control design to land on the string. And we're going to bring it into the, into the present where we're going to start looking at how to make this maneuver more robust and how to uh, incorporate uh, real world sensors uh, to improve this maneuver. So I want to start with describing an experimental aircraft uh, in Corey and Tedrick, and it's the same aircraft that we're going to be building on uh, here. This is basically uh, a simple fixed wing glider, and I know the red's not coming up well for people in the back, but these are flat plate wings with a single actuator at the tail. We call this the elevator, which is driven by a single servo motor powered by a lithium ion battery. And we can measure the position of this aircraft using these reflective motion capture markers, which are able to tell us uh, the position of the aircraft um, uh, when we're in a motion capture arena. And beyond that, we use a uh, onboard receiver which can pick up servo commands um, and translate them from a base station to our, this aircraft. So now we have this very simple aircraft. And the first thing we want to look at is sort of system identification. So there's this great model developed by Corey Tedrick and Poet, which is a simple flat plate glider model. Um, it consists of uh, only seven uh, states, X, Z, theta, uh, and their velocities, um, and the angle of the elevator. And it uses flat plate lift and drag coefficients to model the aerodynamic coefficients on the wing and on the tail. What we do is we want to see, okay, how good, how good is this flat plate model at uh, estimating the aerodynamics of our aircraft? So what we do is we use our Vicon motion capture arena. And if you're not familiar with Vicon motion capture, it basically consists of 16 cameras, which are in, use infrared, uh, the infrared spectrum to sort of pick up those reflective markers on the aircraft and give you a position measurement of the aircraft. Um, and what we do is we're going to launch this glider from a crossbow uh, multiple times. We're going to vary the elevator and initial speeds and try to look at what the aerodynamic coefficients look like in something like a perching maneuver. So we're not executing the perching maneuver exactly, but we're just executing sort of a rapid pitch up maneuver. Now, when you look at these aerodynamic coefficients, um, what you can see is you can see some interesting features. So here's a plot. Uh, the blue represents our double differentiated motion capture data, um, which we are able to convert into angle of, uh, into coefficients of lift and coefficients of drag. Um, this red line here represents the flat plate lift and drag coefficients. And what I do to improve on sort of the flat plate model that already exists um, <coughs> is I add some radial basis functions to improve uh, the fitting to these lift and drag coefficients to get a higher fidelity model moving forward. So now that we have this really uh, high fidelity model, what we want to do is we want to think about how can we get the aircraft to execute a perching maneuver. And what we want to think about is trying to design what we call a nominal trajectory or an open loop trajectory. And basically what that is, is we want to know what kind of input we give to the tail so that the aircraft pitches up and can land on this perch here. Uh, and we're going to define our, our maneuver as starting 3.5 meters from the perch with an initial speed of 7 meters a second and we're going to constrain it to fall within about 6.5 centimeters of the perch, um, which is sort of our capture region for an aircraft, with a final forward speed of about less than a meter a second. Um, and so what we're going to use to do this is we're going to use a method called uh, direct transcription. Uh, and this is essentially a nonlinear optimization method, which allows us to find that elevator command that we give to the aircraft to allow it to perch. Now the thing about this particular uh, nominal trajectory is that it's open loop. And that means that uh, if there's any type of disturbances along the trajectory or any inaccuracies in the model of the aircraft, uh, this, this open loop trajectory that we plan for based on the model that we produce is not going to work. <clears throat> and so we have to find a way to sort of add some feedback stabilization to this nominal trajectory. What we're going to do is we're going to do a time varying linear quadratic angular about this nominal trajectory. Basically, we're going to linearize um, at different points in time along the nominal trajectory build a linear model and use that linear model to find uh, linear quadratic uh, gains that vary in time and bring, sort of drive our, our system to follow this trajectory and we want to be able to hit the bridge. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you what happens if we just run the open loop trajectory. So 
I realize the lighting in this room isn't the best, um, but here you can see there's a little launcher over here on the left side. Um, there's a string that runs between these two poles here. Uh, and what's going to happen is the glider's going to come in from the right, um, and it's going to execute this open trajectory, and it's going to fail. So here is a fast version. It doesn't hit the string. And at a quarter speed, you're coming in, executing this pitch-up maneuver. Because of error in the dynamics and initial conditions, it doesn't reach the string. So what we do is we apply this feedback, and we actually land on the string. And again, I'm, I apologize that it's hard to see with this lighting, but there's a string right here. If you watch carefully in slow-mo, you'll see that it actually lands on this string right here. It's on the whole line page of there. there. You can see. Cool. So this is amazing. This is great. This is, uh, shows basically that we can use this time variant linear feedback to control this very complicated um, nonlinear system, uh, which is under -actuated. But there are some major uh, limitations to this approach. One is that it's a local control. And so <clears throat> what this means is that there's only a small set of initial conditions around the nominal trajectory for which if we start inside them, we're going to be guaranteed to reach the goal. Um, so that means if you perturb it too far in initial speed, for instance, it's not going to hit your target set. Uh, this approach doesn't explicitly account for model errors, um, and it's not designed at all to handle any types of external disturbances. So I want to show you this plot here to sort of just communicate this a little better. Um, so if you look at this sort of light blue region, both these plots are uh, simulations of the aircraft from a variety of initial uh, position conditions and a variety of initial velocity conditions. Uh, this light blue region is basically the region of initial conditions which if you start inside of it, you're going to reach the goal using the time-varying linear quadratic local control. This blue region, on the other hand, is the region of, of, of um, initial conditions that would bring you to the goal if you were able to solve uh, the optimization pro uh, problem online in, in real time. So this kind of shows us the deficiency with our sort of local control method. Something that would be more uh, global would be able to handle a lot more variety of initial conditions uh, for our aircraft, and which is something that we really want for a real world scenario. So what we want to try to do is we want to try and figure out a way of computing what we call backwards reachable sets. Um, and the reason we want to do this is because we want to be able to have an idea in this very high seven-dimensional space of what that initial condition set looks like. So if we just go back to this plot briefly, these are only sampled in two dimensions each. So this doesn't really give you an idea of what the, the aircraft is doing in, in the higher dimensions as far as initial condition sets go. However, this backwards reachable set will give us that information. So how can we go about trying to compute these backwards reachable sets? Well, there's a number of different approaches. Uh, one is a, a simulation-based approach, where we either randomly sample or try to exhaustively simulate to try and find these backward reachable sets. But as you can imagine, this has a number of deficiencies. One being that, as I said before, if you have very high dimensional systems, it's going to become very difficult to simulate all the possible states. <clears throat> Another approach is this HJB approach, which sort of has the same problem. Uh, this basically involves formulating a hamilton jacobi delman equation and using partial differential equation solvers uh, and a discretized state, state space to find these backward reachable sets. And again, you have to discretize the state, state space, and this sort of limits you to about five dimensions. Uh, and then there are sort of other sort of approaches which are not exact verification approaches, such as the sensitivity approach, um, where you sort of look at the linearization of the, of the, of the dynamics and try to uh, derive sort of a backward reachable set, an approximate backward reachable set of those linearizations. Our approach, Our approach is we're going to apply a sum of squares technique. Um, and this has a number of different advantages. One is that it preserves the continuity of state space. So we don't have to uh, sample through very high dimensional state space. Um, it's practical for medium sized systems. Uh, so we can get about up to about 15 dimensions with these methods, which is useful for us if we want to put around an actual three dimensional aircraft. Um, it's been widely applied to region of attraction analysis. So if you want to, for instance, find the region of attraction of a Vanderpool oscillator, you can use a sum of squares approach to do this. Um, and it's recently been applied along trajectories. So to uh, use the sum of squares approach, we have to use uh, what is known as a Lyapunov function. Um, so if you've never seen a Lyapunov function before, we kind of think of it as a positive definite function, which you can in investigate to determine whether or not a system is stable. 
Um, so what we have here is what we call a quadratic Lyapunov function in two dimensions. This sort of gives you an example of what this Lyapunov function looks like. Um, and you can sort of see this is for only a system with two states. And you can look here on, in this plane here of a system sort of uh, progressing towards the origin in this two-dimensional state space. And what happens is as it nears the origin, because the system is stable, um, the value for that Lyapunov function is decreasing. And so you can use these Lyapunov functions uh, and investigate the derivative of the Lyapunov function. And if the derivative of the Lyapunov function is decreasing, uh, you have some guarantee of, of stability. And also, I think to note is that we will be talking about these things called level sets, which are essentially constant values of, of the Lyapunov function. So how are we going to use this sort of in our sum of squares framework? Well, we're going to define something slightly different known as a time-varying uh, Lyapunov function. It's still going to be quadratic. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to not look at uh, stability over the entire function, but we're going to look at something called a set variance condition. And that's all, all that is to say is basically we're defining these things called funnels, um, which uh, we just check along the boundary of the funnel to make sure the Lyapunov function is decreasing. And therefore, we know if we start in the initial condition set of this funnel, we're guaranteed to reach the goal region. Um, so there's been some work done on this um, <coughs> for Rankin in, in 2011. And essentially what they do is they parameterize uh, these time-varying Lyapunov functions. So you can imagine that if you sample your time-varying Lyapunov function at different time samples, you get a bunch of these quadratic uh, Lyapunov functions at different time samples. Um, and they try to grow the level set through a series of iterative optimization steps until it best approximates the true backwards useful set of the system. Um, so when you do this, you can actually compute the, the funnels for our glider. So let me just show you what this is. Uh, Russ was super excited uh, when I was able to compute these funnels using this method um, because of how many numerical problems we ran into with a, with a system uh, like the glider, which had a lot of numerical difficulties to overcome. But uh, what you can see about this is funnel tiny. Um, if you actually wanted to do this on a real aircraft, uh, you'd have to guarantee that initial position is only going to vary about uh, one centimeter upon launch. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of means that you can't really put it on a real aircraft. So, so how can we go about this? <coughs> well, the approach that we take is we actually try to parameterize over the full Lyapunov function. Uh, and we use some uh, various algorithmic techniques that allow us to do this. And what this allows us to do is not only uh, change the level set of the Lyapunov function that we're searching over, but also basically change the orientation of this quadratic uh, or this ellipsoid. Um, and it allows us to better approximate the true uh, backwards reachable set. So when we apply our method, you can see here that all of a sudden we get these very, very large uh, backwards reachable set approximations, which all of a sudden have uh, initial condition sets that are actually can be used on a real aircraft, um, opposed to these sort of smaller funnels which come out of the other method. So this is super exciting to me, um, because I'm sort of experimentalist by nature, and I want to be able to actually test these things on a real aircraft. Um, and so you can see sort of here is sort of the difference in volumes. This is a logarithmic plot how much we can improve sort of the volume of our funnel by uh, adapting uh, this approach. Um, and then what I did before sort of putting us in the aircraft is I looked at sort of simulations in, in lower dimensional spaces to try, try and see, get an understanding of how tight uh, these backwards reachable sets are to the actual, actual backwards reachable set of the tree system. So this blue region here that you can see, um, and if you can see it based on this projector, I don't know if you can. But you can see this blue region here, that sort of represents the true uh, backwards reachable set of our glider from exhaustive simulations in X and Z positions. Um, and this gray region, of course, is, is the funnel that we're looking at. And you can see that although our funnels are conservative, they're actually pretty, pretty tight and almost hit up to at least one boundary um, of the true backwards reachable set. Uh, so this is really exciting to us because it means that we have a pretty good approximation of, of these things. And this is even more exciting because now that we've sort of developed these backwards reachable sets, what we can start to do is we can start to try to put them together into what we call an LQR tree. So we can take these uh, individual funnels, design a new nominal trajectory, stabilize that trajectory, and build an LQR tree for our system. And we can do this for our glider system. And what, and what you notice here is that all of a sudden, our set of initial conditions is much larger. So the, what we can do is when we, we launch our aircraft, we can evaluate the position of the aircraft and the state of the aircraft, pick the correct funnel, and then pick the correct controller to guide it through the bridge. Um, so this is, is super exciting. But the, there's one thing that we're missing, uh, and that is robustness to model uncertainty. Um, 
And so we haven't really thought about, okay, so these are funnels for the, for the nominal system, um, but there could be some error in your aircraft at hand. Um, so there's sort of three different approaches to sort of uh, tackle this idea of uh, modeling uncertainty. One is this approach known as uh, robust verification, where you have some bounded uh, uncertainty, whether parametric or dynamic uncertainty, in your aircraft dynamics. Um, and you can incorporate that and find a common Lyapunov function and try to find a Lyapunov function that verifies a class of systems with some bounded uncertainty set. Um, there's a stochastic verification approach uh, <clears throat> where you actually define something called a sort of martingale instead of a Lyapunov function. Um, and this particular approach gives you uh, sort of a guarantee of probability of reaching the bridge. And then there's an adaptive control uh, method, uh, which I've also worked on, but I won't present here, uh, but I can talk to you about it after if you're interested. And basically, this approach uh, allows you to deal with parametric uncertainty and helps you design adaptive controllers using these model techniques. Uh, so we're going to actually look at this robust verification for our, for our glider. And so what we can do is we can set up our sum of squares optimization program, and we can include in it uh, a constraint on this uh, bounded parameter set. So if we have some bounded uncertainty in our dynamics, we can add it into our sum squares optimization into the constraints, the sum squares constraints, <coughs> and actually find a commonly optimal function that is valid for a class of, of systems which live sort of in some bounded parametric set. Um, so when we apply this to our funnels, what you can see here um, is that we get, if we apply, for instance, bounded uncertainty on the x-acceleration, what you notice is that we get smaller uh, backward reachable sets than for the nominal system. Um, so the green here funnel is representing sort of this robust funnel, and the gray region is representing uh, sort of the nominal funnel. Um, and, and something interesting that you might want to notice is that they shrink. And the reason for that is because when you have some uncertainty that's pushing you out away from your nominal trajectory, uh, all of a sudden you have to start closer to your nominal trajectory to guarantee you to get to your goal. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to sort of evaluate this onboard our actual aircraft and see you know, what kind of results we get. And so when we do this for the nominal funnel, we see that only about 50% of the trajectories uh, that we launch with our glider actually stay in the funnel for all time. <laughs> However, when we apply our robust funnels, we get 80% of them to stay in the trajectory. And you'll notice that there are some of them that are leaving but these ones that leave towards the end here are actually pretty close to your target set. It's just that the Lyapunov function tapers down so rapidly at the end that it looks like they're much further away. Um, if they were to leave over here, they would actually much, be much further from the nominal trajectory. So this is really awesome. It means that we have a backward reachable set that not only uh, we can compute for this very complicated glider system, but we also have something that we can incorporate model inaccuracies into to try and get uh, an accurate representation of this backward reachable set. Uh, it's something that we can use to build a robust LQR tree. Um, so we have these experimental LQR trees that are robust that we can put onto our actual glider. And when we do this, uh, I'm going to show you here, this is a plot of sort of open loop perching trajectories. Um, and so what this is, we're varying the initial speed of our perching trajectory for about six to eight meters per second. The cold color trajectories are low speed trajectories. The hot color trajectories are high speed trajectories. And this sort of black ellipsoid, which is only ellipsoid because this axes are scaled, but it's really a circle, is sort of our target, desired target set. And you can see when we apply open loop control, you can see that the slow trajectories fall short of this target set, and the fast trajectories overshoot the target set. Um, <clears throat> and so when we apply our LQR tree approach, all of a sudden you can see that all the trajectories um, that, are, that are shown here enter into this target set. Um, and just by way, this is about 150 flights. Um, so we've been the flights by various, uh, by common sort of velocity bounds. Um, and we put error bars on them. But you can see that yeah, this is pretty conclusive results that our LQR tree approach is working. Um, so this is super exciting. Uh, and I'm going to show you a video uh, where we're going to show it being tested by a varying initial speed. <coughs> so we're going to start with a slower speed from 6 to 6 meters a second. You can see the perch over here. I know it's hard to see, I apologize for that again. But basically, we're launching the glider, um, and it's just coming up, and there's no active grip, grip, gripping, it's sort of just uh, hanging on, on the string. But we're definitely reaching our 6.5 centimeter target set. And as you notice, as, as the speed starts to increase, you'll start seeing the aircraft start to pitch up further as it picks, 
it chooses funnels in the LPR tree that have higher initial speed. You can see these ones are pitching at very high, depending on the string. So this, here are some results sort of to sort of show you what, what happened in, in those trials. Um, so these sort of plot the final position uh, values of our aircraft launch from a variety of initial speeds. Um, and sort of these, each one of these little plane markers represent the, sort of a mean of uh, velocity bid of final uh, positions for our aircraft. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there are sort of green ellipses that show you the spread in final positions as well as the spread in initial velocities. And as you can see here in the open loop trajectory, we're desiring to get sort of into this 6.5 centimeter gold region. The open loop fails. Uh, quite a lot. The high gradient LQR approach actually um, has an interesting behavior in that around sort of the nominal trajectory here, it does quite well, and below the nominal trajectory, it does well in speed. But as you start increasing in speed, you start losing it, and it starts overshooting the perch. And then if you apply the LQR tree, you're able to grab those sort of four bins of velocities and bring them down uh, and sort of improve the overall performance of the aircraft for higher velocities. So this sort of, uh, sort of shows us that we can use these uh, feedback motion planning strategies uh, to improve the performance of our aircraft. And so this quite wasn't good enough for us. Uh, and so what we decided to do is try and look at other sort of variations in initial pitch. So what we're looking at here is sort of variations in initial pitch. And here I am throwing this glider uh, multiple times in a row um, from, you can see, very different initial pitch conditions sort of wildly different at times, because I'm very bad at throwing, as my, <laughs> as my family will tell you. <laughs> and so you can see here that some are just very high up, and every time you're able to land on the string here, uh, which is almost impossible to see on this video. So, we are not controlling the up. It's all how hard would it be to do that? It doesn't presumably that it's really important. Um, so, it is really landing on the string. No, no, but it would stay if you put a hook or whatever, and it would really stay. Oh, because you would be able to orient it at the end. Um, I think it would be pretty easy to control them all. We, all we've actually done simulations where we show we could do a three-dimensional version of this, um, but we haven't implemented it on the actual aircraft. It would involve basically adding some ailerons and probably a rudder to do that, but like, you could definitely do it, and our methods would scale up as well. There's some cool videos at the end that I think are probably going to there's like 26 flights here. It almost gets boring at times. Um, yep, here we go. So here you can see some slow mo shots where that's a very high initial pitch and it corrects itself and lands on the string right here. Um, here you can see sort of another very high pitch throw in slow motion. You can see how this crazy throw and it comes itself up, correct itself, and then right the So we can sort of do some analysis on, on the results, um, the final results of this. Um, what we do is we pitch, we, we plot the initial pitch results. Um, for, so this plot on the left here um, shows the results of the LQR tree, which only has funnels covering sort of the velocity space. So you can see that it does occasionally reach the goal region for these higher pitch conditions, but not all the time. There's definitely some that are falling outside. Um, and it was probably, you know, every, probably at 25% of the time for these higher pitch conditions they were falling outside. Um, and however, when we add in some, some funnels that sort of cover that initial pitch condition and add those into our health geometry, all of a sudden we get much better results for high, high pitch throws. And you can see almost up to about, you know, 15 or 20 degrees we're able to get into the mean of those trajectories. Into the, into the goal region. Uh, so this is super exciting results. It shows that we were able to cover not only initial speeds, but initial pitches as well. Uh, so this is great. Uh, we've basically shown that we've demonstrated a lot of robustness uh, to initial conditions, which is really important to an aircraft in the field, which could have variable flight conditions when it's approaching the bridge. Uh, however, we, we're, we're still constrained because we're, we're, we're restricted to be in indoor environments. Uh, 
Um, and we're using basically a light convolution capture system to do the feedback. Uh, it's a very controlled environment. So what we want to do now is we want to see if we can push uh, sort of the sensing capabilities of our system and investigate what kind of sensors we could use in the real world and apply our control uh, algorithms to using those sensors. And I want to see if we can actually bring our aircraft outdoors. Um, so what we're going to do for this is we're going to sort of be motivated by an example I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, where uh, we are going to try and sense a magnetic field that's generated by a power line, uh, for the purpose of trying to land on a power line in the field. And so what we do is we build uh, this power line, uh, which carries about 100 amps of current, and it's driven by a, a, a DC servo um, motor amplifier. Um, and it actually produces a pretty large magnetic field that we can sense with a magnetic power. Uh, the nice thing about this is that we can use this to actually localize the aircraft. And it gives us sort of uh, an area of sensors to look at, uh, which would be a sort of a, real, a solution for the real world uh, if we wanted to implement our aircraft out in the real world. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically try to model this magnetic field uh, using EO sub Law. Well, it's a classic uh, method from physics where you look at each infinitesimal um, <coughs> component of the magnetic field from each infinitesimal segment of your current loop and sum those all together to build a magnetic field model. And we're going to use uh, sort of a, a very uh, high resolution uh, uh, Honeywell magnetometer, which can measure down to about 40 micrograms, to pick up our magnetic field. We have this custom, custom sensor board that we put together, which has an AFL uh, microcontroller on board. Uh, we're going to use an IMU to get sort of the pitch estimates of the aircraft. And we're going to use a 24 bit uh, delta sigma analog digital converter so that we can actually capture some of those low uh, magnetic field strings. Um, and then for the on onboard computation to run our control laws, and to run um, uh, the estimator on board, we can use a Gustix Linux computer, which is sort of, you run an embedded version of Linux. Um, so here's sort of a topology of our sensing board. Essentially, we have our 80 mega uh, microcontroller, which uh, does all the low-level signal processing. These low-level signals get passed up to our Gumstix, which does the estimation and the control. Um, we have data coming in from our Honeywell magnetometer and our RMU, and all of our controls are going up to our servo motor. Um, and on board that AtML uh, microcontroller, what we're doing is we're doing some uh, synchronous demodulation. So if you think about it, uh, if you hold the magnetometer fixed in the magnetic field, what you're really seeing is sort of a some DC field value or low frequency value being modulated up by about 60 hertz. In our case, it's being modulated up by 80 hertz because we're using 80 hertz magnetic field signal to get away from the 60 hertz noise indoors. But nevertheless, you're, you have some low frequency signal being modulated up to a higher frequency. And so what you can do is you can actually apply synchronous deep modulation to uh, grab most of the real and imaginary components of your signal. Uh, and so basically, if you have your uh, magnetic magnetometer that's moving more slowly in the field, it's much slower than sort of your 60 hertz, um, you can back out the real and imaginary components of uh, the signals that are being picked up there. Um, and so this is important for us to do sort of with our uh, extended common filter tracking. Um, so if you look at sort of the magnetic field, one of the main problems with sort of tracking the aircraft in the magnetic field, um, using magnetic field measurements, is that there's these ambiguities that, that pop up. Um, so if you just know the magnitudes of the magnetic field vectors that you're receiving from your magnetometer, um, you get eight possible locations for your aircraft to be in. Um, if you start adding more information, then you start, you're able to sort of resolve which one of these ambiguous situations you are in. Uh, so this is, resolving these ambiguities is important for us uh, because our perching maneuver is going to come in and dip through these two possible ambiguous conditions and we don't want to lose tracking when it does that. Uh, so our approach is to use an extended common filter but actually try to estimate the phase of the current flowing in the wire um, to resolve some of these ambiguities. And that's actually pretty successful. So here you can see a plot. Um, the, the yellow line represents me sort of sweeping the magnetometer through uh, the field in front of the current carrying wire. Um, and the yellow is the uh, measurements we get from our Vicon motion capture systems. And the red measurements on top of that are the measurements that come from our, our estimator. And you can see there's some distortion down here at the bottom, um, but that's probably due to the, the iron and uh, steel running through the floor. Um, um, so this is great. This shows that we can do a slow, uh, steady sinusoidal sweep through X Z space and get some reasonable estimates. Um, but can we actually put this on board our, our glider and sort of get uh, results um, at fast enough update rates online to do control? 
Um, so first we show that we just shoot a glider off, and we shoot it off at <coughs> uh, and execute a nominal trajectory uh, without any control, and we show that we can actually track the aircraft um, at reasonable rates, and we can compare it against, again, the yellow is motion capture, and the red uh, is, the, uh, is, is the magnetic field measurements. Um, and then what we do is we try to take these measurements, and we use them in our closed loop control algorithm, and we test it first indoors, uh, and compare it against the motion capture results. Uh, motion capture closed loop purchase results. Um. <coughs> and so I just want to sort of set up, I'm going to show you some indoor successful purchasing results using this uh, magnetic field uh, sensing. Uh, our, our power line. Um, I'm going to run these a little bit slower. And we're actually still landing on the string, which we offset from our power line and we know the location of, just to sort of protect the glider from colliding with the power line. But you see that we can still uh, achieve uh, closed loop perching using these magnetic field signals. Uh, I'll show you some slower versions. Um, so here's the string right here. Here's our power line, which the glider is sensing. Uh, on board are the, all the onboard electronics and the computer. It's pitching up. You can see the elevator wiggling. It comes down right on the string. So here's some results. Um, so here we're again flying the final positions of this aircraft with respect to the target set. We look at the open loop case for this heavier glider model, uh, and you can see that uh, 53 trials are run. Some of the most closely nominal trajectory actually do get in, but a lot of them don't get into the, the target set. If we close the loop using Bicon motion capture, um, all the, uh, pretty much all of the position points get in, into the target set. And then similarly, if we close the loop using the onboard sensor technique, uh, we start to lose it a little bit towards the end here at the higher speed, but more or less, it pretty much is comparable with our uh, Bicon motion capture program. And here's sort of uh, sort of plots of uh, various uh, different sort of bins of speeds, initial speeds, and they're all entering this target set. And you can see the green lines here are sort of our tracking using the magnetic field. The blue is the actual position that you know, measured using the Bicon motion capture. And over here is sort of a picture of the estimation area error, just to give you an idea that even though at about four and a half meters from the perch, uh, we start with about an error of 20, uh, 0.25 meters, as we get close enough to the perch, we drop down uh, to a much better error, so below about five centimeters, uh, which means that we actually can resolve the string when we get close to the perch. That's all I'm trying to show you. Um, so the next thing we decide to do is let's just take it outside and see how well we can do. Um, so we can do pretty well uh, until we start getting faced with wind. And you can see the glider sort of drastically fails in these windy conditions. Uh, again, we tried to move to get away from some of the wind. We were able to perch for a little while, and then all of a sudden the wind found us again. Uh, right around 12 o'clock, as it always does. Um, and you can see that good, nice gust right around the perch, and we sent us right over the, over the perch. And some people asked me if that was our last flight uh, for the day. And I said, no, this next one is our last flight for the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so wind is a big problem. And it's not surprising our glider doesn't have a pedal on it or any type of feature like that. And we're not even controlling uh, three dimensions. So it's not surprising that wind is a problem. But we're still going to look at you know, methods that we could use to try and improve our responses to external, uh, external disturbances uh, and see if we can apply some of our similar control methods. We sort of, we've shown so far that uh, we're robust to initial conditions indoors. We've shown that we're robust initial conditions um, using uh, real-world sensors, and we can actually go outdoors to find the external disturbances that we'd like to investigate. And now we're going to have to come up with some methods to handle uh, those external disturbances. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, this idea of turbulence and wind gusts. So in the aerodynamics community, uh, basically, uh, turbulence is sort of described as sto a stochastic process where white noise is passed through uh, a, a low-pass filter and it produces some type of uh, random output. Uh, and a gust is defined as sort of a, a small snippet of this turbulence, which is sort of uh, a distinct uh, profile of the turbulence. Uh, and again, so it, essentially this is modeled as your white noise comes into some low-pass filter, and then this gets injected into your plant right now. Uh, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can sort of create this low-pass filter that shows up in the aerodynamics community um, and incorporate, actually try to essentially model some aspects of the wind so we can get this proof control performance for our aircraft. Um, so what we're going to use is we're going to use this very nice uh, 3D ultrasonic anemometer which has resolutions down to 0 0.01 meters per second and an update rate to 30 hertz so we can actually use the wind measurements um, in real time uh, to try and control the aircraft if, if we want to. Um, so here's sort of just a plot of raw uh, wind velocity data um, in sort of the three components, X, Z, and X Y, and Z. Um, you can see it sort of varies between plus and minus uh, five meters per second. Outdoors, this is taken right outside of Stata. And we just run it for two hours. Um, and then what we try to do is we try to fit a model to it. So we're going to uh, do sort of a, a simple uh, RMAX modeling um, and try to fit a first order model to this data just to see if we can sort of capture some of those first order dynamics of the wind. And so when we do that, um, here's a plot of sort of the power spectrum that comes from uh, that two hours of data collection. Uh, what you see is this green line represents sort of our first order fits that come out of uh, sort of the standard uh, <coughs> RMAX, uh, ARX uh, function in MATLAB. Um, and we're able to get uh, data with cutoff frequencies of about 0 0.14, 0 0.3 hertz for the, for the um, horizontal and vertical velocities that we care about in two dimensions. And so then we have to figure out, okay, so how are we going to get this wind into our glider model? Um, so what we can do is we can actually augment our state of our aircraft uh, with velocities in X and Z, the wind velocities in X and Z. And we can actually incorporate the model of uh, <coughs> the uh, wind velocities into the state uh, of our system. And then we can actually um, build uh, our sort of same uh, model-based control strategies on top of this model and try to get improved performance. Uh, and so the nice thing is that uh, it still makes sense to sort of do linear quadratic regulator, time varying linear quadratic regulator around these novel trajectories like we did before, uh, simply because the linear quadratic regulator is not only meant to sort of give you a minimum response to initial conditions, uh, variations in those conditions, but it's also meant to give you uh, an optimal uh, control in the presence of uh, uh, variations of ga Gaussian input disturbances. So we're going to keep using our, our time varying uh, linear feedback, uh, which is, comes from the up to our solution. Um, and we're going to sort of use our uh, robust funnels to sort of build a funnel that um, is robust to the input uncertainty into, into our wind gust model. And here you can see again the green is the robust funnel, and the, the gray is the larger nominal funnel. And what we're going to do is we're going to build this really cool looking uh, LQR tree um, <coughs> for various wind conditions. So just to give you some intuition, this is just sort of the LQR tree in a slice, a slice of a high dimensional object in X and Z. Um, and what you can see here is sort of this is this top neck branch here is probably a case with very little wind, with very little headwind. And this bottom case here is a case where you have a very strong headwind and you have to drive down to the head menu and pick it up and bring it in the bridge. And again, we're going to look at this without any sort of propeller on the aircraft. And I'm going to show you some simulation results, and I want you to sort of look through these different features uh, in, in those simulation results. It's actually pretty interesting. Uh, so first I'm going to show you the case without any wind compensation. So you can see here, we're, we're estimating, we're simulating our glider in sort of this wind field, and you can see it's just completely failing under these wind conditions. They're looking very similar to what we saw outdoors. You can see it's just getting sort of blown right around. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply our LQR trees approach. And you can see, all of a sudden it's able to more intelligently pick the trajectories for different wind conditions and add in these, uh, these models of the wind and very much improve the performance of our aircraft. And this is super surprising to me, um, simply because there's no propeller on this and it's able to still sort of find these really beautiful trajectories. Of course, for a limited set of wind. What kind of wind profile is um, So we're using a we're using a first order uh, uh, model for the wind profile. So no, no standard wind profile, just because we have to keep. So the dry wind profile model would be what we would use um, ordinarily, but it's it's a higher state model, so we want to keep our state size low for the verification. Uh, yeah, so we're, 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 oh no, no, it doesn't change spatially. We're assuming just sort of a uniform wind field in space. Yeah. 
Um, so if you look at the plot of this, this is a plot of the trivariant LQR, which incorporates the green feedback. The green is the simulation results, uh, including the, the wind model into the air um, And this blue line is what happens if you still use the feedback, but you don't include uh, the wind model in the aircraft. You can see that we get about up to about uh, a 6 meter, 0.6 meter a second of wind headwind that we can stabilize the aircraft. Um, if we apply our LQR trees approach, all of a sudden we can get up to almost a 2 meter, um, uh, two meter uh, a second wind gust and headwind uh, and still be able to achieve bridge. So this is again, this is your 6.5 centimeter, this line here represents your 6.5 centimeter capture region. Um, and so now I'm just going to talk briefly about sort of our future plans for doing some outdoor experiments and see if we can actually use some of our technology that we've developed to, to implement those outdoors. And I'm going to show you some preliminary results and sort of my thoughts on how, how we'd be able to go about sort of testing this approach. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use our ultra, 3D ultrasonic anemometer to measure the wind field uh, in the vicinity of the bridge. And we're going to assume that the wind is not varying in space uh, largely uh, in, sort of in the vicinity of the bridge. Um, and we're going to only launch the glider when we're sort of, when we're in this bounded sort of region of wind. And then we're going to feed back the wind measurement uh, to our aircraft, um, and we're going to try to uh, show that we can approach any wind gusts. Now I'm just going to show you some uh, preliminary flights outdoors, and you're going to see the glider sort of be pushed a little bit by the wind to the side, but still be able to approach uh, when it's using this approach. So here's our sort of outdoor setup, um, which is uh, very much fun to set up uh, in 30 degree weather. Um, <coughs> so um, you can see here's our glider on the launcher. You can see here's the anemometer. You can see here's our uh, power line. And here's our base station. So you can see we launch it, and our glider is able to land on the string. You can see it being sort of blown off course a little bit in this sort of headwind that's coming out of it. Slow motion, boom, a bit to compensate. And it's using feedback from this anemometer that's sitting here. So I want to summarize some of my uh, contributions of this, of this thesis, thesis work. work. Um, one of the main contributions of this work um, is that we're able to uh, solve for uh, backward useful sets for, for very complex systems, uh, more complex than, than have ever been able to done before. Um, but Dell developed and demonstrated uh, post stall perching for a very wide range of initial conditions and really sort of uh, improved the performance of our aircraft through a, a wide range of, of input uh, initial conditions. Um, and we've also demonstrated a successful closed loop perching uh, using sort of uh, sensing, sensing methods um, motivated by real world scenarios. Um, and we also developed uh, some control methods for handling external wind, wind disturbances uh, due to gusts. Uh, and the main take home message uh, that I want you to walk away from here with um, is that you know, this control design using feedback motion planning can really drastically improve the performance of your system, especially if you have a, a system that's a local to a non-local trajectory. You can really capture some really beautiful behaviors of, of the aircraft um, by sort of exploring those initial condition sets, designing separate trajectories for those initial condition sets, um, and then designing these backward useful sets to choose between these motion, uh, motion capture libraries, or these motion primitive libraries. <coughs> um, and on, on top of this, I've also shown that fixed wing perching uh, is a, is a viable approach for real world missions. And I have a feeling that, uh, depending on where I end up after this, I may be actually working on trying to bring this into the field. So, for some future work, what I'd like to sort of investigate is think about uh, 3D power line perching um, and scaling methods uh, for higher state spaces. So, I just want to let you know about some, some work that's been really amazing work that's been going on in our lab. Um, here you have this Atlas robot with something like 68 states, maybe more. Um, I could be wrong about that, but at a very high number of states. Um, and we've recently shown in uh, control, uh, control design uh, using some of the squares for this very high dimensional, or met, uh, some of the squares like methods for this very high dimensional robot. So if you're not doing, paying, paying attention to some of the, the work that's been coming out of our lab recently, uh, you should check it out. It's really great. Um, uh, in addition, I'd like to sort of investigate uh, new actuator designs such as warping wings and propellers, uh, sort of uh, adding them to the perching maneuver. Um, I'd like to sort of start looking at the adaptive control methods that I've done some theoretical work on, um, start uh, investigating that uh, for the onboard uh, sensing. 
And I also like to start trying to fuse these magnetic field measurements with other sensing systems, uh, such, as, such as cameras, for instance. We have a really great stereo camera system. It would be great if we could um, sort of use both of them together to sort of uh, locate a fridge. Uh, and then I'd love to be able to fridge up the power. So I just want to make some quick uh, acknowledgments. So yeah, so I want to really thank my, my advisor, Russ, um, for all the guidance uh, over the years. And uh, just, Russ has an incredible uh, sense for what, what problems to pursue in robotics and, and really sort of going after the really interesting problems. Uh, it's been really super fun to work in this lab uh, with all the great people. Um, and just every day, it's, Russ has a new idea that's just sort of pushing, pushing the frontiers of, of robotics um, in different areas. And it's, been a, it's been a real joy. Um, and I also want to thank Rick Corey, who's uh, sort of, uh, uh, who's one of my mentors when I got here early on, um, and uh, just came up with a really great, uh, uh, unique purchasing problem, almost, almost a kind of canonical example, you know, under-actuated robotics. Um, that just has been a wealth of study and, and, and research direction. Um, I want to thank Robot Group Commission 1.0, uh, the group of guys that were here when I, when I got here a very long time ago, but most of us uh, since graduated, uh, John Roberts and, um, and Alec, and, and uh, Michael Levishaw, um, and those folks. And a lot of the work that's been done here has uh, sort of grown out of a lot of the good help and feedback they've given. And then, of course, uh, youngsters, the <laughs> Robot Love Motion Group uh, 2.0, sort of the group that exists now. Again, uh, just the feedback has been valuable. Um, just talking to people like Andy Berry um, about sort of hardware problems and, and talking to Ani about all the different uh, ways that we can sort of tackle these some of the problems. Um, that's been a real, a real great uh, experience. Uh, I want to thank Jim Hober, uh, who, who helped uh, uh, as a magnetic field expert, helped a little bit with the sort of development of these magnetic field models. Um, I want to thank the uh, Distributed Robotics Lab. Um, talked to a lot of you guys uh, during this research, um, and especially Kyle Gilton, uh, who's since uh, moved on, <coughs> but uh, helped a lot with sort of helping me get my, my feet wet in sort of uh, embedded electronics and other uh, areas of electronic design. Um, of course, I want to really thank my thesis committee, um, who's been uh, just uh, giving me a lot of support over the last uh, year uh, and helping me pull uh, sort of my research together. I had to have a lot of good insight on uh, how to make uh, this a better uh, thesis presentation. Um, and of course, I want to thank my wife, Julie, who has uh, been there with me every step of the way uh, through the long haul of graduate school and uh, uh, couldn't have asked for a better spouse. And I think she probably deserves an honorary engineering degree after listening to the Ramble Battle and stuff. So, <laughs> Uh, I want to thank my family and friends, like I think pretty much my entire family is here, as well as sort of my in-laws. Uh, it's just amazing that you guys were able to come up here. I'm really blessed to have my uh, grandfather and grandmother here. I'm um, really blessed to have you guys here with us. Um, and I want to just thank my uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has sustained me through this whole process. So with that, I just want to open the floor up for any questions. <laughs> But we're gonna we're gonna have open questions for everybody in the room. Uh, so go ahead and fire away. And then after that, we're gonna ask all, all the people that are on the faculty and and, uh, and staff at MIT here to to stay, and uh, we'll grill them with more detailed questions. And then we'll invite all of you to join us, uh, assuming everything goes well, and for a celebration down in the lab uh, shortly after that. Can you use any of these uh, these yeah. And as you said, they are very simplified. Intuitively, why do they work in the sense of impulse or something? So basically, it involves that the maneuver is very short. So there's not a lot of time for sort of errors in the other dimensions to sort of accumulate and integrate up and sort of give you very big yaws or very big rolls. Um, so I think that's one, one um, reason why they work. Um, so you, you don't have to worry about those higher dimensions uh, or the, the sort of three, three dimensional effects. Um, yeah, and I think. Uh, I think primarily just having the fact that we have sort of uh, horizontal stabilizers and things like that to sort of keep it flying straight out of the launcher helps a lot. But yeah, it's surprising. Um, initially, we had sort of a, uh, a dihedral to keep it keep it from rolling, and we ended up being able to take that out uh, because it was unnecessary and just made the, the uh, aircraft design more complicated. Hi, Joe. Um, I think you did a great job, okay. um, and then including in this you know, presentation. Um, not too much showing the uh, you know, many equations. We only have 
exposed to a bunch of uh, <laughs> So just to clarify that what you mean by a robust nest, uh, you know, uh, which is very important part, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, you, you just showed the basic concept and didn't go to uh, so the spot. But uh, in fact, you did it. Uh, yeah. right? So just to clarify to this, you know, you know, um, you know uh, audience uh, exactly what the sort of robustness yes. yeah. so we that, you know, uh, kind of here. And that's number one. And then number two, um, the, you know, last part, the statistic in the stuff, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed the part. Uh, please just clarify the, what you mean by robustness in the, uh, you know, statistic in the framework. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, so for the robustness, I, I looked at a bunch of different types of robustness. Robustness is with uh, parameter uncertainty, for instance, robustness to um, uh, changes in your uh, changes in your coefficient of width. Um, so we're able to compute models for that. For this particular work, I looked at robustness um, to bound uncertainties in X acceleration, uh, and that was enough to sort of get our funnels uh, down to working in, in a reasonable regime uh, for us to achieve uh, these, these results. Um, and then with respect to the stochastic case, um, you know, essentially looking at uh, instead of looking at white gaps and input noise to these low-pass filters, I'm looking at some bounded input noise uh, in simulation. Yes. So, in your system, you're looking at, I guess, the, the geometry of the system allows you to have more control over the way that you're actually feeding back and controlling to actually just make it look nice. So you have like a sound system, like just say a ball or something that you have like so, if you want to like make a system where you want to have a basketball always go into the basket or something like that, um, do you think that there could be enough control with that with some type of feedback or? I, well, I mean, you need to have something actually on on the ball. Um, so that's the first thing. I, I think um, you could do a lot of work of trying to figure out what kind of uh, finding the right set of initial conditions to launch the ball from. But I think that you probably need to have an actuator on the ball for that actually goes kind of. I guess because I guess my question is. If, Say you wanted to theoretically at any initial condition get something that always goes to something. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not as it doesn't generalize as, as much as that. Yeah. Um, I thought I a very nice presentation. Really, it's, it was nice to see how everything came together. Um, in, in I thought I heard you say in one of the slides that you are able to scale up the problem. I said in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sister Day's question yeah. about including the third dimension. Yet in one when talk about the adaptive chapters, um, the introduction of the data and the data dot in, in the whole um, uh, LQR pre-construction, you mentioned that, that that really is not a real-time you know, feasible solution because it increases the dimension. So um, how are the two conflicting each other? No, so I guess I, I think you're addressing two different issues. Um, one is the issue of uh, for higher state space dimensions. And that's totally, totally doable. Even with the adaptive case, you can scale to higher dimensions. That's not the restricts sort of approach to the adaptive case. It is restrictive in the sense of that for the adaptive control methods that um, I talked about previously, um, that <coughs> you actually get two parameters for every unknown parameter in your sum square. So you actually, for every unknown parameter you have, you get two extra state variables to think about. Theta, theta, uh, no, um, theta and uh, theta hat. Yeah. Um, so it, it scales a little bit worse than just sort of s just scaling up to three dimensions. Uh, the adaptive does. Um, the other thing that you're sort of referring to from the thesis is that um, in the Lyapunov function itself, the adaptive uh, control design techniques actually contains uh, beta uh, beta tilde. Um, so if you wanted to evaluate that online, um, you'd have to be careful about how you did that and sort of bounding your initial uh, estimate of beta tilde to be able to actually check and let, see whether or not the stars can follow. And that's the part that you kick is not, is not possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in some sense, that means that parametric uncertainty really cannot be dealt with. Um, so that's not true. So parametric uncertainty in the plus case, we have some bounded parametric uncertainty can be dealt with. It's only the fact that in the, in the adaptive case, um, where you have uh, sort of uh, something that- So you that can't add learning in addition to the-, the, the So, so, so just answer this a different way. So you can't add, uh, you can't add, in a, in a good way, you can't add the uncertain parameter into your algorithm function and still build the LQR tree. So there's some work for robust verification where they actually add the parametric uncertainty into the algorithm function itself. And you can actually get larger uh, uh, verified regions in the sum of squares analysis. 
You can't do that here. You have to just yes, put it in as a boundary. I mean, the only purpose for introducing yeah. those, those terms in the diagonal function is to have some sort of a learning mechanism. Yeah. And so if that is counter to that, then what this means is you can do robustness but not necessarily learn it. Yes. What happens when you when you need to saturate your actuators all the time? So that's a great question. So um, actually, you can include uh, input saturations uh, all the time, like every Not five steps. Uh, uh, just that you encounter that in this mission. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you can actually incorporate, and, and we've shown this, that you can actually incorporate uh, the input saturations, uh, specific, specifically the input saturations, into uh, the verification procedure. Uh, and also, it also is natively sort of part of the optimization routine. The trajectory optimization, because we use this direct method, which allows you to impose constraints. So both of those methods are good for for um, for uh, handling um, saturations. Uh, you just have to put it in. Every time. So would you do them both under? Yeah. Both? Yeah. You, you, I mean, we, I so I pick R and the LQR cost, right? Because you have to pick R and uh, So when I design the LQR controller, I pick R such that they, they don't usually saturate. Uh, but you're going to come to a situation sure. where you have to say. Sure, yeah. You could definitely incorporate it into the Yeah, definitely works. You just, you just include it into the, uh, into the sort of uh, optimization scheme and add the brush multiplier on that saturated bound constraint here. So that's another constraint in your optimization. Yeah. Wonderful. Could you try this step to land on the ground, you know, in short, uh, you know, short distance, on the ground effect and so on? You have to start from scratch, or can you use most of this? That's a really good question. I think the, the part of the answer I don't know is I don't know um, how the model of ground effects would, would affect it. Um, I imagine that you would have to find a good model of that. If you could find a good model of the ground effects, you could directly apply this method. Um, yeah, I, you might also have to think about, um, based on how you're coming in, you might have to think about uh, adding into the funnel some constraints on making sure your tail doesn't hit. But you could also add that into the funnels. And actually, there's some work in our lab done right now trying to fly through force, and they add in sort of these constraints in, into sort of the verification procedure to avoid obstacles. So I think that would, th this taken with that put together could probably handle that case, if you could get a good model. Um, how difficult do you think the, the wind estimation part would be? Uh, excuse, excuse me? How difficult do you think the wind estimation part would be? Wind estimation. How hard would it be to actually oh, estimate oh yeah. the wind? So that's a great question. Um, so it is actually uh, pretty hard to estimate the wind um, for this particular maneuver um, for a number of reasons. Um, and that is if you don't have any measurements on board of, of your oncoming wind flow, um, then what happens is you can get in a case where if your model is perfect, you can estimate the wind pretty well uh, using some adaptive techniques. However, if your model is imperfect, um, then that model imperfections get pushed into the wind estimate, um, and cause very wild oscillations, and those oscillations will get fed back into your controller and cause the controller to fail because these are local controllers. So you can run some problems there. And I, I, I've done that in simulation and seen that happen. So, so is an imperfection in terms of the order of the model? Like no, said? no. Uh, imperfections specifically in the, air, in the aircraft model. So if you're not modeling, you know, perfectly all the voices you shut off the wings and things like that. Those get those errors get pushed adversely into your into your uh, estimation. Okay, I'll end with an easy one. So, if you had to estimate how many times you shot that plane out of the cross <laughs> over the years, I mean, like it's, it's ten thousand. Well, ten thousand, I guess. I mean, this guy has really done an amazing amount of work to do this. I mean, I do appreciate that. So uh, let's thank Joe again. And then we'll, we'll kick most of you out. Uh, anybody who's on the faculty, please stay and, uh, and, and help us grill Joe. And then uh, we will meet you out back down in the lab, in, in the robotics lab, uh, 32380, to celebrate and, and we'll